Hey everyone, I'm Hannah and welcome back to another episode of Pleasure Trove, the only series on YouTube where we talk about culture and news to do with sex. Yes, that's right. So unfortunately, in this episode, I have no physical things to show you, but still lots to talk about, lots to discuss, so we're just gonna dive right in. First off, let's chat about what's been in the news. What are people talking about? So the first thing that I wanted to discuss is two celebrities, very different coming out experiences. Recently, Philip Schofield, who hosts This Morning, came out as gay and actress Jamila Jamil came out as queer. And the response to both of these kind of announcements, I guess, were very different. The way that Philip came out was a statement through this morning's social media and then him and his co-host Holly sat down on the live morning TV show and kind of discussed it and it was very lovely, very heartwarming, a lot of stuff about support and family and mental health and love and just being your true self. I thought it was gorgeous and wonderful and I'm so happy for him. And from what I was seeing on social media, the general response to Philip Schofield coming out as gay has been positive. There were outcries of love and support for him and just general acceptance, which is great. Obviously, that is great. Jamila Jamil came out as queer in a Twitter statement after backlash against the announcement that she was going to be a judge on the show Legendary, which is about voguing and ballroom culture, which has deep roots in the LGBT community. And obviously she did receive a lot of support for her coming out, but the, her coming out was kind of like one part of the statement in general, which was about, is she or is she not qualified to be part of this show? She has a huge audience online. She's bringing new people to it. She even says in the statement that being queer doesn't automatically qualify her to be a part of the show, but more just bringing new eyeballs to it. And there was a lot of support surrounding her statement, but equally there was a lot of confusion and even more backlash. I think in general, a lot of people find Jamila Jamil an easy target online. She is very outspoken. She is an activist. She's not always getting things right in her activism, but who is? And I'm going to link in the description a really interesting article about the differences between their coming out experiences, but ultimately I think it comes down to the fact that Phillips was a very proactive coming out. It was a statement that was very clearly thought through for a long time before there was a strategy almost behind it. Um, and Jamila's was very reactive and people didn't really seem to like that because it was about something else and then it's like, oh, but actually I'm queer. Jamila has a boyfriend and so I think a lot of the backlash around that was bi erasure, pan erasure. And also Philip came out as gay, which most people understand. Most people in society, different ages, different generations, that is something that people have a concept and an understanding of. And a white man coming out as gay feels familiar to most people in our society. However, it's a different story when a woman of color comes out as queer. And I just want to be clear here that I don't think it should be the case. Like I think the two should be the same thing and we should be supporting and believing anyone who comes out as whatever label they feel suits them the most. For older generations, queer was a slur and by some it's been reclaimed. And I think it's just really interesting to see these two different experiences, an older white man coming out as gay and a younger woman of color coming out as queer, who is also femme and has a boyfriend. So I think there's just a lot more backlash around Jamila Jamil's announcement than Philip Schofield's. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this in the comments, what you think of their coming out, what you think of the responses to it. I would be really interested to know. One of the other things that Jamila mentioned in her statement was coming out as queer and talking about sexuality as a South Asian woman and being worried about the response from the South Asian community. And I just wanted to highlight this amazing website and community called Soul Sutras. I met the woman who runs this platform recently, Sanjita, and she is amazing. And it is a place for South Asian women to talk about taboo subjects. So they cover loads of stuff from sex, sexuality, 
periods and mental health. Um, so I'll leave that also in the description if you are interested in checking that out. So the second big news story, we need to talk about consent contracts. Oh boy, I'm gritting my teeth because why are we talking about this? But clearly we have to for some reason. <sighs> Okay, so this whole conversation started recently when the New York Times podcast did an interview with the lawyer who is defending Harvey Weinstein. She is a woman and she primarily defends men who are accused of sexual assault. And I would highly recommend listening to the original podcast. It's very interesting because like the first part of it, like the majority of it is a pretty much civil interview between two people who clearly have different views. Um, she seems very smart and is kind of very gently offering you rape culture on a plate, but unless you're listening really carefully, you might not be able to hear and properly like see it as rape culture. And then it just explodes at the end. And there is no more denying that this woman's views are really dangerous. She talks a lot about how not being sexually assaulted is the woman's responsibility. So this very much plays into rape culture and victim blaming. The interviewer, Megan Tuhe, asked the lawyer, her name's Donna Rotuno, at the end if she'd ever been sexually assaulted and she said no because she's never put herself in that position. And I saw a lot of people shouting about this on social media and a lot of women replying to this tweet thread with the position that they were in when they were sexually assaulted. And this ranged from babysitting, to being at work, to being on a date. But here's the thing about the consent contracts. So at the end of the interview, Donna says, if I was a man today in today's world, before I was engaging in sexual behavior with any woman today, I would ask them to sign a consent form. Okay, let's unpack this. So the main reason why a consent contract will never work in preventing sexual assault is all down to one very key component of consent. And that is, it can be removed at any time. And then your contract is void. Consent is conditional. You may consent to some sex acts, but not others, with some people, but not others, with a condom, in bed, on the sofa, like whatever it is, there are conditions to the consent and you can change your mind at any time. And if somebody changes their mind, then you communicate. I cannot believe we're still having this conversation. And what's missing from this entire conversation is any focus and interrogation on the actions of perpetrators. I wanna draw your attention to a article that Girl on the Net wrote about this, and I'll link it in the description, and I would highly recommend that you read it, but it really opened my eyes on a few things and the way that we can discuss and think about sex contracts. Firstly, consent contracts are bad for a potential victim. Maybe you sign away that you agree to do X, Y, Z, and then in the moment you decide you don't fancy doing Y, but then you feel like you have to, or you're being pressured into because the other person is like, hey, you signed on the dotted line. I have your agreement. Here's your signature. You have to do this with me now. So we are going to be doing X, Y, and Z. But what if, and we're going to be hypothetically imagining a consent contract in this scenario. Please don't ever sign a consent contract. But what if you negotiated beforehand and you said, okay, yes, let's put in X and Z in this contract. I'm happy to do X and Z. And then when you're in the moment and you're like really enjoying it, you're like, actually, I do want to do Y. And the two of you are like, yeah, yeah, we want to do Y together. It's not in the contract. It's not in the contract. So you probably shouldn't do it because then that's rape. I'm doing this because this is a hypothetical situation. So no one wins in consent contracts because it's completely ignoring the fact that consent is fluid. And you might not just change your mind to something that you agreed to previously and then you don't want to do anymore. You might also change your mind to something that you said you didn't want to do and now you actually do want to do it. So thank you girl on the net for like making me realize that flip as well. Like no one wins in consent contracts. 
No one wins. But the potential victim definitely doesn't win. If someone wants to make you sign a consent contract, rip it up and get out of there. But also, that's not your responsibility to do that and we should be interrogating the person's decisions and thought processes to write a sex contract? Anyway, and one of the other things that Girl on the Net wrote in her article, which I just thought was really wonderful, because she's talking about how she's so tired of having conversations about consent and what it is and what it looks like. And she talks about not looking for consent, but looking for desire, because consent is like the bottom line. Like that should just always be present. And then what's the really exciting thing is the desire. That's the thing that you should be after, because if there's that there, then the consent is just always there, should be always there. So it's not just, hey, do you want to have sex? Yes, great, consent, tick. It's how do you want to have sex? Where do you want to have sex? What do you want to do? Why do you want to have sex with me? Ooh, like all of those things. She was talking about how she finds those conversations much more exciting and sexy. So yes, we should be having those conversations and it's a real shame that we still need to be drilling home some basic points about consent. Let's move on! Now we're getting into some TV stuff. I watched Louis Theroux's new documentary on BBC Two called Selling Sex, which was about sex work in Britain. It followed three women who were all doing sex work for various different reasons and I thought it was really interesting to see all of their different lives and the different reasons why they do it and what they get out of it and how they feel about it. It did kind of bother me that basically all three of them had troubled upbringings or some kind of abuse when they were younger, which I'm not saying isn't real because I do imagine that that is real for a lot of people in sex work, but it was painting sex work in a certain light, which felt like you have to have experienced trauma in order to go into this kind of job. No one else, a normal person without any trauma would never choose that. Like that's kind of how it felt sometimes. I'd be really interested to know what other sex workers thought of that documentary and if they felt like it was a true representation. Obviously, it never can be because it's only three women um, and that's only three individuals experiences but there were a lot of similarities in their three experiences I was like it must be broader than this and then finally I watched Goop Lab more specifically I watched the one episode of Goop Lab about female pleasure Goop Lab is Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop's Netflix documentary series Um, Just putting it out there, I am not a fan of goop. It's pseudoscience expensive vagina nonsense. (laughs) So I watched the Betty Dodson episode and actually, you, you know what? I enjoyed it. I did find it really shocking though that in that episode, we see Gwyneth Paltrow learn the difference between the vagina and the vulva. She just thought that everything was called the vagina, when in fact the vagina is the internal part and the vulva is everything on the outside. And I was like, this is a woman who has been selling products for the vulva and for the vagina and doesn't know her anatomy. And she sells products for the vagina and she doesn't even know what the vagina is. And I found that kind of disturbing and sad, but was I actually surprised? I don't know. Some of the episode was a bit too hippy dippy for my liking, Um, but I did really like the exercise that they did with hand massages and instructing each other on how they would like their hand massage to go and using that as an example of how you can instruct someone when it comes to sexual pleasure. Now, here is a question that I have for you because I'm a bit confused about what language to use. So in this episode, the language that they use is female pleasure, woman's pleasure, female sexuality, and they are specifically talking about people with vulvas. And we know that non-binary people have vulvas, some trans men have vulvas, and so 
the words female and woman aren't necessarily applicable to everybody who has a vulva. So when we're talking about anatomy specific, we should probably talk about anatomy. So say people with vulvas, people with penises, or whatever the anatomy that we're referring to is. However, there is also an element to what they were discussing in the episode, which isn't about anatomy, it's about socialization. And it's about that socialization that female pleasure is less important than a man's pleasure and that women aren't really encouraged to look at their genitals or to masturbate. And so these two things we're talking about at the same time, we're talking about how to touch a vulva, but then we're also talking about reducing the stigma around um, pleasure for people who are socialized and raised female. So when we're talking about anatomy and socialization together, what language do we use? I would be really interested to hear your input on that because I struggle because then basically in the same discussion, I'm flip-flopping between using women and using people with vulvas. And I don't know if that's confusing. I don't know if that is problematic. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, let's move on to events. I want to tell you about Decolonizing Contraception's Sex Fest, which is happening in April in Camden, and I believe tickets are on sale now. There is a recent episode of my podcast Doing It with Dr. Annabelle Shoamimo, who is the founder of Decolonizing Contraception, and it is a non-profit community organization created by people of color who work in reproductive and sexual health. And SexFest is a sexual health and well-being event for people of color. So I'll leave links in the description if you want to go and check it out. It looks like it's going to be really interesting and really amazing. And also have a listen to the episode of Doing It with Annabelle. I learned so much from it. And I've got something in stuff for you. Stuff, stuff, stuff. This was actually suggested by someone on Instagram, um, at Jade Adu, I'm really sorry, <laughs> and it is a reusable tampon applicator. Um, they're called Dame, and I'll leave their website in the description. Looks really cool, super fancy and slick and interesting. Um, they say that the applicator is for life and carbon neutral. These are the claims they're making. They also sell um, organic tampons. So when I used to be a tampon user, I would only be able to use it with applicators. I was never able to use tampons without the applicator. But then you're just like throwing away tons of cardboard and plastic. But basically it's a reusable tampon applicator and that sounds amazing. And you just rinse it and dry it with like paper towel or toilet roll to clean it. And then you can use it again. And they say that it's for life. I'm intrigued. Does anyone use this? Is anyone willing to try it and feed back to us? I am genuinely interested. I don't have periods anymore with the um, contraception that I'm on. Otherwise I would be like super down for trying this. Also, it looks really great and has really great packaging. <laughs> so thank you so much for watching this episode of Pleasure Trove. Please give the video a like if you enjoyed it. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on everything that we've discussed in the comments. This is a conversation and yes if you have ideas for things or you, if you notice something that you'd want to see featured in another episode of Pleasure Trove then you can tweet me you can um, message me on Instagram that's usually the best places um, and yeah thank you so much for watching please subscribe and hit that notification bell and I'll see you in my next video bye <laughs>